Matthew is quoting from Isaiah 42, verses 1 through 4, I thought this morning that we would just go straight to the text of Isaiah 42. And I've titled the message this morning, as you see in your outline, <clears throat> the title of the message is The Servant. And let me kind of set the stage for you, if I may. Isaiah 42 is one of the very important servant passages in the book of Isaiah. Okay? In the book of Isaiah, the idea of the servant is one of the key themes. It's one of the key ideas. And one of the ways that will help you and I to really appreciate what is going on in Isaiah 42, verses 1 through 4, is to notice a word that is used there. And it's the very first word in verse 1, and it's the word behold. That word behold is an attention grabber. If I was to shout out this morning, behold, what would you do? You would look up. You might even be a little startled. But you'd listen. He's going to say something that's very important. And he doesn't want us to miss it. So Isaiah, in, in that text, it starts out, behold. Now, if you look at that passage in Isaiah 42 verse 1 and then you flip back one one chapter to Isaiah 41 you were in 42 excuse me and if you turn back to 41 verse 24 and 29 both of those verses begin with the word behold so in Isaiah 41 verse 24 and 29 the writer says behold and then in 42, 1, he says, Behold. But in both cases, they are drawing attention, and we have to understand this to get the full appreciation for our text this morning. It is drawing the attention to idolatry. So the problem that is the backdrop of Isaiah 42 is idolatry. And when you take Isaiah 41 and Isaiah 42 and contrast those two, what you have is a contraction between idols and the living God. Isaiah is addressing that problem of the children of Israel and they're going after idols in 41. He's saying you're going after idols. And then in 42 comes the prophecy of the promise about the servant. And this morning, I'm going to share with you <clears throat> three things from our text in Isaiah 42. The first thing I want to share with you is the problem with idolatry. The problem with idolatry. The problem that Isaiah was speaking to was the problem of idolatry. And, he, and it's not, let me just share this with you, that problem is not some primitive problem. Okay? It is still a struggle in modern day times, is it not? Especially if you know what idolatry is, and I'm going to be sharing with you what it is. It's not just a problem of the nation of Israel and the children of Israel. Uh, many people are tempted to idolatry today. Now, when we think of that word idol idolatry, it doesn't mean that you're making some little statues or idols of gold or silver or wood or stone and you're bowing down to them in some primitive fashion out in the wilderness. It doesn't mean that. Idolatry, here's the definition for idolatry. Idolatry is anything where we find our satisfaction, our security, and our treasure in someone or something other than God. That's idolatry. Jeremiah chapter 9, verses 23 and 24 tells us this. He writes this. He says, Thus says the Lord, Let not a wise man boast in his wisdom. Let not a the mighty man boast in his might. Let not a rich man boast in his riches. But let him who boasts, boast of this, that he understands and knows me. It's kind of like what Paul said. 
that I am the Lord who exercised loving kindness, justice, and righteousness on the earth, for I delight in these things, declared the Lord. Now, there's nothing wrong. Now, listen to what I'm going to say here. Listen carefully. There's nothing wrong with riches, might, and wisdom. There's nothing wrong with it. But when you boast in those, when you worship those, when you find your satisfaction in those, your security in those, and that, when you put your treasures in your wisdom and your might and your wealth, then you are boasting in something other than the ultimate God. And that's what makes it wrong. Because all three of those things, your wisdom, your might, and your wealth, beloved, they come from the Lord anyway. You were not born with those things. God gave those to you. And if you have those things, I want to tell you this morning that God is better than those things. He is the source of those things. He is the one who gives you those things. And he cannot be replaced by those things. But people all the time are tempted to trust in those things instead of the Lord. It's kind of like, you remember some of the first things when our kids were little, our grandkids now, they say, I can do it myself. They're putting themselves in authority. They're saying, I can do it. And don't we do that when we, when, even when we get older? And we put our satisfaction, we put our security, we put our treasures in what we can do. And that's wrong. And when you do that, beloved, here's the thing. Here's what Scripture says. When you do that, instead of worshiping God and you're worshiping your might, you're worshiping your wisdom, you're worshiping your wealth, you have just become an idolater. That's what you become. You're worshiping the creature rather than the creator. You're worshiping the gift rather than the giver. And all of us are tempted to do that at times. Why? Because we're humans. And sometimes we buy in to the philosophy of the world today. And if we're not careful, we'll get drawn into that. And those things are not ours anyway. They're God's. You know, a little earlier ago, in, in any church this morning that meets together, we do a thing that call, we call, we take up the offering. Okay? And we all give a certain percent of our income to the Lord. But in reality, folks, it all belongs to God. Your whole check, your retirement check, your, your social security, all that money is literally not yours. It's God's. We just give back a portion to the Lord. Now, idols may not be bad things in and, the, in and of themselves. I'll tell you that right now. Because sometimes those things are family, they're friends, their jobs, and their even our vacation. But when we put anything instead of God, even family members, even friends, even our job, even our vacation, when we put them as a substitute for the ultimate, which is God, then those things become idols. And it's wrong. The, your ultimate satisfaction... Your ultimate, my ultimate satisfaction, my ultimate security is not in things. It's in God. And you know, I've known people throughout my life that have had, as the old saying goes, boatloads of money. They can buy and throw away and buy and throw away and not think a thing of it. And they are some of the most miserable people that I've ever seen in my life. And I have seen people in my life that does not have one red dime. They don't have two coins to rub together, as the old saying goes. But they know who they belong to, and they know that God is their God, and they are the most happiest, well-content person 
and on the whole world. It's what we put as our satisfaction and our security. And again, beloved, if it's not God himself, then it's idolatry. And so that's the problem that Isaiah is speaking to. And again, I want to share with you, it's not just a primitive problem. It's a problem that challenges all of us today. So let me ask you this morning, and I could almost, now notice what I said, I could almost, I'm not going to. I could almost quit right after this. But let me ask you this. What if those things that you put your security in, that you put your satisfaction in, that you put your treasures in, that you put your fulfillment in, that you put your identity in, what if those things were taken away? What would you have? A lot of people would say, nothing. I'd be so miserable. I wouldn't know what to do. That's because you put those things as the ultimate of your satisfaction. But if you have God as your security, if you have your identity in God, if you have your fulfillment in God, if you have your satisfaction in God, beloved, that cannot be taken away from you. Nothing, no one, nothing, and no circumstance can take God from you. And Isaiah is saying the only hope is the servant that God provides. Number two, the second thing I wanted to share with you is this, is the, prom, the promise is the servant. I want, you, I, want, I want you to see four things about this servant that we, we're, we're told about in, in Isaiah chapter 42, verses 1 through 4. The first one is this. Notice what is said about the servant, okay? Notice what's said about the servant. That's why I hope you keep your Bibles open. It says, behold, now who's speaking? God is, right? God is saying, behold, my servant whom I uphold, my chosen one in whom my soul delights. This servant, and we'll find out who he is in a minute, okay? We all know but we'll proclaim him in a minute. This servant is appointed by God and chosen by God. It's God who has chosen him. It's God who, is up, who upholds him. It is God who equips him. And it is God who supplies him that everything he needs to do God's work here on this earth. But notice that last phrase. I love this last phrase in Isaiah 42. He says, in whom my soul delights. In whom my soul, God says, rejoices. In whom my soul makes God happy. God delights in this servant that he is promising to you and I. Again, this servant is chosen by God to do a very important task. Amen? And the Lord uses very powerful language to, to, to talk about him. He says, my soul, my soul delights in him. He's saying to the people of, of Isaiah's times and he's saying to the people of our times today, here's the solution, Israel. Here's the solution, America. I'm going to give you my servant in whom my soul delights. When everything, when, when something happens in America, as tragic as shootings are in schools, what is the first thing that comes out of the mouth of everybody? We need more gun laws. Would more gun laws really make the difference? No. I'm sorry. It sounds good, but it wouldn't make the difference. You know what would make the difference? God. The teaching and preaching of God's holy scriptures. When you change man's heart, when you change woman's heart, 
then you have real solutions. All the other stuff, as well-meaning as they are, are just band-aids on a gaping wound. The real solution for whether it's Israel's problem or America's problem today is the servant of Almighty God. That's who it is. Now, let's look at the second thing about this servant. In verse 1, Isaiah writes, God is speaking though, he says, I have put my spirit upon him. He will bring forth justice to the nations. This servant of God is going to establish justice unlike the unfaithful, unjust leadership of Israel back in Isaiah's time. Just like the unfaithful, unjust leadership in America's time. And that means both in ministers and government leaders as well. This servant is going to lead faithfully and with justice. It doesn't matter what side of the track you were born on. God is going to deal with you like he deals with everybody. And that's justice, isn't it? That's what justice is all about. Treating me, dealing with me, the way you treat and deal with everybody else. And that's how God does it. God does not, it does not matter to God what your last name is or my last name. He deals with us upon who we are. Now, when you and I hear that word justice, normally we start thinking about fair and righteous society, and, that, and that's true here in Isaiah. And Isaiah is speaking to that in this context of the unjust unfaithfulness of the kings of Israel. Because I tell you what, you study the Old Testament, and you see where God, had, God puts in some good, godly kings, and Israel starts following those good, godly men, and what happens to Israel? They prosper. But then Israel gets their eyes off of God, and they start putting in men in leadership and their kings that want to do things their ways and forget God, and the people start following that, and what happens? Here comes problems for Israel. But behind the idea of justice as a nation, here specifically is this, and I thought this was amazing when I was studying this text. The, the, the idea here is, is justice of the truth of the word of God. This servant is going to preach and teach righteously the word of Almighty God. And isn't that what Jesus did when he walked this earth? How many times did he look at the Pharisees and he said to these religious leaders, have you not read? Have you not heard? And that was an insult to those guys because they were the learners. They were the leaders spiritually. They were the ones with the PhDs. And here's this dirty, dusty, itinerant rabbi named Yeshua. And he said, have you not heard? Have you not read? That the scripture says this and you say that. And in our language today, Jesus would be saying the word's going to win out. And it always will. Amen? And this servant is going to bear witness to the truth of God. And that's what Jesus did when he walked this earth. It is God's word. It is truth that the world needs. And his servant is going to bear witness to that. He is going to establish it. Now, notice as well, he is not only going to establish justice in Israel. But look what it says at the end of verse 1. It says, in the what? Nations. Now, I want you to see something here that is so interesting. It's so important. 
The word nations there in verse 1 is lowercase n, correct? Whenever you find the word nation or nations, plural, s, and that n is lowercase, it is talking about the Gentile world. All right? So this servant will bring justice. He will bring the truth of God's word to the Gentiles. Now, how many of us this morning could raise our hand and say we're Gentiles? Every single one of us are too. Because in biblical days, it was either you were Jewish or you were non-Jewish. And the non-Jewish were classified or called Gentiles. Or unless I don't know about your ancestry, I would say that all of us here this morning are Gentiles. And God is saying in Isaiah 42, he is saying, my servant is going to bring and establish the truth of my word even to the Gentiles. And aren't you glad he did? Aren't you glad? I am totally glad. So, okay, what have we seen? The Lord delights in this servant of his. This servant of his is going to establish the truth of God's word to the very ends of the earth. Here comes number three. Look at verse two. Isaiah 42, verse two says this. Now notice these words. He will not cry out or raise his voice, nor make his voice heard in the streets. What does that mean? In other words, this servant of God, when he comes, because Isaiah was looking to the time that Messiah is coming, he's not going to be startling you, screaming at you, and ranting and raving at you. He is not going to shout you down. He is not going to be self-promoting like the Pharisees were and the religious leaders of Isaiah's time were. How many times when Jesus walked this earth did Jesus say about the Pharisees that they stood on the street corners and prayed their prayers, long, lasting prayers, loud prayers? And he said, why are they doing that? To draw attention to themselves to promote themselves as someone that is so holy, so righteous. And God is saying in Isaiah 42, verse 2, that this sermon, he's not going to do that. He's not going to do that. Look at the very beginning of verse 3. Isaiah writes, A bruised reed he will not break. Or a dimly burning wick he will not extinguish. The servant, this servant of God, though he is going to establish justice, he is going to do it in such a way that he's not going to shout you down, argue with you, or be self-promoting. In fact, he is going to carry himself in such a way, and I love this, he is going to carry himself in such a way that he is tender and concerned and caring toward the weakest of people. Even to those who could be described as a bruised reed or a smoldering wick. A little candle that's just about to go out to the person who is right at the very end of their rope. That person who is ready just to break. This servant is going to be so loving and so kind to them, he's just going to draw them near him and draw him to him. Now, is he a holy servant? Yes. But he's a loving servant. He's a caring servant. 
as righteous as he is going to be, he is still going to be tender to the weak. And he was tender to you and I when we were weak in our sins, was he not? And he drew us to us lovingly. The fourth thing I want you to see is in verse 4 of our text. Isaiah writes, he says, He will not be disheartened or crushed until he has established justice in the earth and the coastal lands will wait expectantly for his law. Now, folks, there are some people today, and you may be one of them, but there are many, many people today that are disheartened, are they not? They see what's going on in the world today. They see what's going on within their own families. And they are so disheartening. They are just, it's almost as if they are crushed. There are people in the world today that they are doing well. They're trying to do the best that they can, can for themselves and for their families and to take care of their families. And it's almost like they can't see anything good that's happening. And they just want to give up. And they just feel with all the pressure of the world and everything, and they're trying to do their best, that they are just crushed under this heavy load. But Paul the Apostle writes over in Galatians chapter 6 and verse 9, he says this, he says, Let us not lose heart in doing good, for it due time we will reap if we will not grow weary. If you're doing good, don't get disheartened. Don't become crushed. Don't lose heart. God will take care of you. And in due time, He will bless you. And Paul writes that under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit because, like I said, there are many, many people out in society, and there are many, many people, beloved, and you, we may not see this, right in the church of Jesus Christ today, they are feeling crushed under pressure. They're feeling down. But the verse in our text in Isaiah 42 tells us that this servant will not be disheartened. He will not be crushed until he establishes justice or establishes the word of God in the entire earth. This promised servant will be the one in whom God's soul delights. He will be the one that establishes the word of God and the truth of God to the very ends of the earth. Kind of sounds like the Great Commission, doesn't it? But he is going to be tender with the weak. And praise God, he will not be crushed and he will not be disheartened in the task that God has given him to do. He'll accomplish it. Amen? Now, turn with me to, over to Matthew chapter 12. This would normally be our text today. Matthew chapter 12, verses 1 through 15. Or 12 through 15, I'm sorry. Here's what is happening. Okay? Remember two weeks ago we studied about the Lord of the Sabbath and how Jesus' disciples were going through the field and they were picking the grains and they were eating them and the Pharisee says, oh, that's against God's law. And we showed that according to the Old Testament rule it really wasn't. Okay? In verses 12 through 15, I want you to pay attention to verse 14. Now the Pharisees went out and conspired against him as how they might destroy him. Okay? And then, right after verse 15, Matthew quotes our scripture in Isaiah 42. 
They're trying to destroy him. They've gotten together, they've conspired together, and they're going to try to destroy Jesus. Now here's the response of the Lord to their plan when we read it in verse 15. But Jesus, aware of this, withdrew from there. Many followed him, and he healed them all. In other words, Jesus didn't get into a shouting match with the Pharisees. He didn't argue with the Pharisees. He wasn't self-promoting like the Pharisees. The Lord just withdrew. And when he withdraws, he tells those that are following him, he says, don't get into a shouting match with them. Don't argue with them. Don't be self-promoting. Those kind of people like the Pharisees, God will take care of those kind of people. God will take care of them. He'll deal with them. You just don't argue with them. Don't get into a shouting match. I'll never forget, I was with a bunch of pastors one time, and one of the pastors looked at the other one. He said, I know, let's just pass the time away as we were traveling wherever. He said, let's argue scripture. And I was a young pastor at the time, and I thought, what? Argue scripture? I thought, that is the dumbest thing in the world. And the one pastor looked at me and goes, you want to get involved? And I said, I don't need to argue scripture. I said, I let God say it. I said, if people don't agree with me because of what I've read in the scripture, I said, they're not really disagreeing with me. I said, they're disagreeing with God. I said, and God will deal with them. I didn't know that's what Isaiah was saying. I don't need to argue scripture. You don't need to argue scripture. We just need to be telling people of the truth of the scripture. Now, the third thing I want us to see is this, is the provision of God's servant. Now I'm going to ask you the question. Who is the servant? It's not other than Jesus Christ. That is who the promised servant is. It's Jesus. And think of what we've learned so far about Jesus. In Jesus... God's soul is delighted. God finds joy. You remember at Jesus' baptism? What did God say about Jesus? This is my son in what? In whom I am well pleased. He was basically saying what he's saying here in 42 of Isaiah. My soul delights in him. Jesus will establish God's truth, his words, to the ends of the world. But then I like what Matthew writes at the end of verse 21. And this ought to bring delight to you and I. In his name, in whose name? In Jesus' name, the Gentiles will hope. Praise God. You know, beloved, there's a lot of hopelessness going on in the world today, is, is there not? But I'll tell you what, you can take all that, and if you have Jesus as your Lord and Savior, you can have hope through the darkest of hours. I met a man who was over in China. He was with the China Inland Mission, a missionary organization, right before Mao Zedong took over in communism. And Dick Hillis was on the last boat out as the communists was coming in. And they got into Shanghai, and all of a sudden the harbor's doors of Shanghai were closed. And Dick and his wife and three kids had got out of the interior of China, and they made it down to Shanghai, and now they're stuck in Shanghai. And they're saying, nobody's going to get out. Nobody's going. And years later, when I had the opportunity and the privilege to listen to Dick Hillis talk, someone asked me, he said, well, Dick, what, what was it like? He said, were you, were you full of hopelessness? 
And Dick just looked at him like he wanted the look on his face like, are you crazy? And he said, listen, he said, my hope is in God through Jesus Christ. He said, and if God wanted me to stay in Shanghai, he said he would have provided. He said, but he didn't. He said, in a last minute, a last minute mess up by port authorities, let that ship out. And Dick and his family were on it. But he said, even if I would have stayed, my hope is in God through Jesus Christ. Well, what's the take home of Isaiah 42, verses 1 through 4? Beloved, there are over 2 billion people on this planet that name the name of Christ. They, they, they profess Jesus Christ as their Savior and Lord. Okay? And we can praise God for that. Over 2 billion brothers and sisters in Christ. But that doesn't mean that we can stop there, does it? Because there's a bunch more that isn't. There's still millions upon millions of others that you and I both know who do not know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior and they do not have any hope today because of circumstances in their lives. But you and I have the hope of the, the servant, Jesus Christ, and beloved, it is now up to you and I to give them the hope to share with them the truth of the scriptures of the word of God so that they can have hope that those that do not know the servant, Jesus Christ. And that's our mission, isn't it? Not only as Grace Baptist Church of St. Genevieve, but it's our mission as Christians because you know and I know and you work and I work with people that are not Christians and they have no hope. And you see it in their lives day in and day out. And beloved, I'm going to ask you today as, as children of God to commit yourself and as I commit myself today to start telling the unsaved about the servant of Jesus Christ and his willingness to save them and give them hope. Then, the fulfillment of Isaiah 42, verse 4, will be fulfilled. Because we've taken the truth of the Word of God to them. Amen? Well, let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we, we bow before you today. And we thank you for the provision of Jesus. We all need him. We needed him as our Savior and our Lord before we were saved, and we need him now as our Savior and Lord to lead us and guide us as we are saved. We know what it's like to try to find our satisfaction, our, our, our security, our treasures, and other things other than the ultimate comfort. But Father, I pray today that you help us to recommit our lives of knowing that you are the ultimate satisfaction of everything that we go through. You are our ultimate security. You are our ultimate identity. And help us to know, Father God, and to see that you will not fail. Father, I pray that you lead us and guide us and you help us to share the hope of the truth of your holy scriptures to those around us who feel like they have no hope. Father, I pray that you direct us and you guide us. In Jesus' holy name, amen and amen. I'm going to ask you to take your hymnal, please. <clears throat> and let's turn to page 317.
We're going to sing only trust him. If there were people here this morning that did not know Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior, I'd say you need to only trust him in your salvation. And that's so true, isn't it? But you know what? You and I today as believers, we need to trust him and only him for our satisfaction, our security, our joy, our peace, everything about us. So as we sing this song, only trust him. Let's sing it as a way to praise him and to tell him, God, everything of this earth, we're trusting in you and you alone. If God speaks to your heart and you want to pray and you want to come up here to the front pews and pray or, or here at the step and pray, you do what the Lord leads you to do. If you'd like for me to pray with you, I'd be honored to. Let's sing.